Do you know the difference between a centipede and a centurion? How about a millennium and a millipede? Dave Reagan's latest book explaining the reality, necessity, and timing of Jesus' millennial reign is guaranteed to bless your socks off. Stay tuned. Welcome to Christ in Prophecy. We're delighted to bring you another wonderful book by the founder of Lamb and Lion Ministries, Dr. David Reagan. Dave, we're so glad you could come back and be with us today. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. I nearly fell out of my chair when you were talking about the difference between a centipede and a centurion. <laughs> well, you, uh, you upped the ante and made it a millipede or a millennium, and That's we're so true. glad you did. You know, Dave, you make a comment in your book that after interacting with pastors and churches and even individual Christians for many years, you found a common trait regarding Bible prophecy, or at least the attitude, and you label that characteristic abysmal. Yeah. What is the state of much of the church regarding God's prophetic Word? Well, I would sum it up with three words, ignorance, apathy, and uh, confusion. And uh, that's primarily with pastors. But with people in the pew, I would say a lot of it is fear. They don't even mm. want to talk about Bible prophecy because of they, they, they think it's all about uh, wrath and tribulation and things of that nature, uh, although many are very curious about it. They'd like to know something about it. But it main, mainly is just ignorance on the part of both pastors and the general public. Well, I found the same thing, but you suggested there is a solution to this malady of ignorance, but it involves an offensive five-letter <laughs> word. Well, that's true. That letter uh, word, word is spelled S-T-U-D-Y, <laughs> a study. It does take some study to get on top of Bible prophecy. and. Unfortunately, we're in a time when people want short videos and they want short sermons and they want everything to be, you know, condensed and on and let me move on. And it's not a time of serious study. Mm. Dave, uh, you start the book by listing the different viewpoints of the end times. Uh, what are the four main viewpoints concerning the end times? Well, in the book I talk about uh, the four major viewpoints. I do a little introduction of them and then I talk about each one in, in particular. And those four viewpoints are historic uh, premillennialism, which was the viewpoint of the early church fathers, uh, almost unanimously. And what that meant was it's simply that uh, they believed that Jesus was going to come back and reign for a thousand years over all the earth from Jerusalem, historic premillennialism. Okay. Then the second view that developed was amillennialism, and that's kind of a strange word, amillennial. It, it's the way you negate something in Greek. You put the A in front of it. So amillennial means no millennium. But what that really means is no literal millennium. They have spiritualized the millennium to say, well, we're living in the millennium now, that Jesus is reigning over the earth from uh, heaven through the church. And the person that developed that was St. Augustine around 400 uh, A.D., and uh, he became the most influential of all the church fathers, had more impact on Catholic doctrine than anybody else. And so the Catholic Church over the years accepted that position. And today, uh, that is the predominant position in all of Christianity, held by the Catholic Church and by most of your mainline Protestant denominations. They have spiritualized it to mean something other than what it says that we are in the millennium now and it started at the cross and it will go till the time Jesus returns and the thousand years simply means a long period of time, doesn't mean a thousand years. Then in the 1600's a Unitarian pastor by the name of Daniel Whitby, a person who didn't even really believe in the deity of Jesus, uh, he developed the concept of post-millennialism which I consider to be the most un, uh, unbiblical of all the viewpoints. It simply says that Things are going to get better and better until finally the church uh, uh, converts the entire world. And then the church will reign over the world for a thousand years. And then Jesus will come back and we'll present the kingdom to Jesus rather than Him presenting it to us. And that's so unbiblical because the, the Bible teaches that the vast majority of humanity will always reject the gospel, will never come to the gospel. And the road to hell, hell is very wide, the road to heaven is very narrow. And then the last of the four major viewpoints is what I call modern premillennialism. And it is like historical premillennialism except that 
it has a rapture at the beginning of the tribulation. So you have the rapture, the church is taken out, the Antichrist appears, he rules for uh, you know seven years during the tribulation, and then Jesus returns and conquers him and sets up his kingdom for a thousand years. So the only difference between historical premillennialism and modern premillennialism is the rapture that is separate and apart from the second coming. So those are the four major viewpoints. And then I decided to add another major viewpoint that's not normally considered. In fact, I've never seen a, seen a chapter written on it. Mm, yeah. And that's called pan-millennialism. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? I think that's really the, the major viewpoint yeah. held by more than any other view. Even those who claim to be amillennial, if you ask them what that means, they say, well, I don't know, that's what my church says. I, I, I'm just, you know, I just believe it's all going to pan out in the end. Right. <laughs> I've heard that so much. You know, when I first heard it, I thought it was very funny. And then it ceased to be funny. And then it got to be aggravating to the point that every time a pastor would say to me, well, you know, I'm pan-millennial. I believe it will all pan out in the end. I had to bite my tongue because what I wanted to say is you just admitted you're too lazy to study God's Word and find out what it says on the topic. Wow. And that's sad because one-fourth of the Bible is prophetic in nature. And, and w you can't just set it on the shelf. I guess they do. But you shouldn't set any of God's Word on the shelf and say you're not going to uh, uh, teach it. Or, and, and it's even more tragic when you consider the fact that the signs of the times have all converged for the first time in all of history, pointing to the fact that we are living on borrowed time and Jesus is about to return. And yet the average guy in the pew doesn't know that because the preacher never preaches it. Amen. Absolutely. You know, one of the things you made a good point is people say, well, that historic pre-millennial viewpoint uh, really doesn't have a whole lot of, of discussion uh, amongst the early church fathers. But you said there's a reason for that. They were focused on other doctrinal and foundational issues of the church, and yet they still had an expectation of Jesus coming soon well, because true. they adopted an Aramaic phrase expressing their hope that He that's would. Right. Well, the, the early church fathers were, did not write a lot about Bible prophecy because that's not what they were focused on. They were focused on major issues like the divinity of Jesus, the triune nature of God, uh, how a church should be organized and how it should relate to other churches, and surviving persecution. Yeah. That's what they were focused on. So they didn't write that much about it, but the ones who did were premillennial in nature. Yes, sir. Well, why do you think uh, Oh, and one other thing. Sure. You mentioned a word ah. that they use. Yes. yes. We the still word, use it. The word they use is from 1 Corinthians right at the end of it in that in chapter 16, and that is Maranatha, which is an Aramaic expression for, O Lord, come. And they used that for the first 300 years in the church's history. They would, they would greet each other with Maranatha. They would say goodbye, Maranatha. It was kind of like aloha, you know, it was <laughs> hello and then goodbye, and it was expression of how we want the Lord to come, and that just faded over the years. Yes. Well, why do you think an Augustine broke from 300 years of tradition and then started spiritualizing the millennium to just mean a general period of time? I would say two major reasons. One is that uh, he was very anti-Semitic, and by the year 400, all the church fathers, without exception, I think, uh, I don't know of any that were not anti-Semitic in nature. Anti-Semitism just took over the church. And they argued that since the Jews had killed Jesus, that they, God has washed His hands of them, has no purpose for them left. And they did not like the idea of premillennialism because it teaches that it's going to be basically a Jewish kingdom where Jesus is reigning from Jerusalem through the Jewish people, and the Jewish people will be a blessing to all the world because they will be believers in Yeshua at that time. And they just could not accept that. They said, no, God has no purpose left for the Jews. And then a, a second reason uh, that they did it was because by amillennialism argues that the church is the kingdom. Right. And so it gave more importance to the church and to the Pope, for example, because if the Pope is head of the church, then the, all the nations of the world should submit to the Pope and to the kingdom of God on earth. And so they, they like the idea of elevating the church to the point that it is the kingdom of God, period, and all that ever is going to be of the kingdom of God. And, and then a third reason that I should mention is that by 400 A.D., a lot of the church fathers had been enamored by spiritualizing Scripture. Yeah. The idea that, well, you know, the, the, the surface, there's a surface meaning, but the real meaning is deep inside. And only we who are church fathers, only we who are really skilled in the Scriptures know what it really means. 
And so they came up with all kinds of absolutely bizarre interpretations. And incidentally, I, I mentioned some of those in the book. Uh, one of them in particular I won't even mention here, but I, <laughs> you'll find it in the book of how yeah. bizarre these interpretations were. And, and uh, one that show you how frivolous they were, in the city of God, which I had never read, I'd always quoted it, but I finally read it. You read it. Okay. I'll tell you. Big book. It'll put you to sleep fast. <laughs> uh, Augustine argues against the 1,000 years in Revelation 20 as meaning 1,000 years. And the only explanation he gives is that 1,000 years represents 10 to the third power, therefore it is uh, uh, symbolic and not literal. <laughs> Interesting. But that's all, only only explanation the man gives. That's his rationale. And, and you have a story you've shared many times with me is that back when you were growing up in your church, oh. your church had adopted amillennialism to the point where they refused to sing a certain hymn because it showed a future kingdom. What hymn was well, that? that, uh, uh, that well, anything that mentioned the kingdom in the future. But okay. the prayer, the thing that was absolutely amazing is they told us it was a sin to say the Lord's Prayer. Sin to say a the Lord's Prayer. A sin to say the Lord's Prayer. Because the Lord's Prayer says, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. They said the kingdom's already come. So if you pray that, you're praying a prayer that has no meaning whatsoever. And so you shouldn't pray it because the kingdom's already come. The kingdom is the church. That's all the kingdom is. I can't huh. imagine that such a lack of faith that you would not even want to point people to the greater <laughs> uh, glory and the hope that we have in Christ's return. But, you know, that attitude is pretty much reflected in a guest preacher I recently heard at an evangelical church who said as a throwaway comment, folks, we're living in the midst of the millennium and the tribulation right now, but I don't have time to explain. And, and he never explained, but another very gifted theologian who was there present, I was speaking to afterwards, and he said, well, that's because that man is an amillennialist. And yet that view was largely discredited, uh, as was postmillennialism in the last century. Well, I say in my book that when people, uh, that Arnold Fruchtenbaum is a Messianic Jew and a great Messianic Jewish scholar, and uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum once said in a lecture I heard of his, when people tell me we're living in the millennium now, I say to them, if we are, then I must be living in the slum portion. Exactly right. <laughs> well, well, speaking of, again, a, a, another viewpoint that was discredited in the last century, even more so than amillennialism, is postmillennialism. And yet, having fallen into discredit because of the wars of the last yeah. century, it seems to be making a resurgence today. Well, Why is to, that? To explain that, uh, people need to know that Postmillennialism was developed by uh, this, this fellow Daniel Whitby at a time when people were putting their faith in man rather than in uh, God. It, during the you know the, the great revolution that occurred in, in thinking and it, where everybody began to think that well our real hope is mankind and the leadership of men. So it, it's a very humanistic view because it says that the man is going to improve in quality over the years and to the point that. The church is going to convert the whole world. And when the church converts the whole world, the church will reign over the world for a thousand years. So they are, belie they are believers in, uh, in pro uh, uh, the progression of mankind is going to be better and better, inevitable progression toward betterness, toward uh, uh, being uh, kinder to each other and so forth. Which the Bible says in the end times, it's going to be like Noah's day yeah. when people are hating each other, killing each other, immorality everywhere, and yet they argued, no, it's going to get better and better. And to the point that at the end of the 19th century, all of your major denominations were post-millennial. And they were all arguing that 20th century will be the century of the church. In fact, the Disciples of Christ denomination, they changed the name of their, of their magazine to the Christian century because it was going to be the Christian century and we're going to go out and we're going to conquer the world for Christ. Well, World War I and World War II just devastated that viewpoint. Sure it did. died. You, I only know of one major book that was written uh, in the first half of the 20th century advocating post-millennialism. And I wanted to call the author and say, are you living on an island that, that you don't get the news every right. day? And, but at the end of the 20th century, it started coming back. And post-millennialism is a bad interpretation because it takes two verses out of context, right? Yes, it does. There, there are two verses in particular that uh, it takes out of context. If we go over there to the uh, uh, post-millennial uh, viewpoint, you will see where I write in detail about post-millennialism. And you will see that uh, one of those verses is Acts 3.21, 
We're, and they usually quote it this way. They say, Jesus must remain in heaven until all things have been restored. Well, that's not what the verse says. The verse says, Jesus will remain in heaven until the time for the restoration of all things. Well, the time for the restoration of all things is the millennial reign. Yes. Yes. That's when the Bible says it's going to be restored. And, and then the other one they use is Matthew 24, 14. And they say that it says that the gospel of the kingdom must be preached to the whole world before the end will come. That's what the verse says. And this verse, they say, requires the world to be converted to Christ before He comes. But the verse doesn't say that. It just says we're going to preach the gospel to all the world before Jesus returns. It doesn't say we're going to convert them. Most people will not convert. No, know most that. will not. Most will reject it. And, and in fact, we're in the process of doing that now through the Internet, through satellite TV, satellite radio, everything else. Uh, we are sharing the gospel to the whole world right now. Well, I know that Christians who are dedicated to the primacy of Scripture uh, are sometimes hesitant to embrace something that would be called modern. Me uh, being a conservative, I, I don't like things that are newfangled <laughs> per se. And so for those of us who stand on Scripture alone, sola scriptura, why do, should we not have an issue with what you have labeled modern premillennialism? Okay, well, a lot of people do. Uh, I would say there are many arguments against the premillennial, uh, I mean the pre-rapture uh, uh, concept. But the main one that people do uh, use is they say, well, it's too new to be true. And they point to, uh, to one person, and, and that's to, uh, what's his name, uh, John uh, Darby, Darby. Uh, in England in the early 1820s. And they say, well, that's where it started, so it's too new to be true. Well, first of all, that's not where it started. In fact, we've had uh, research recently that has shown that, uh, that there were many people who believed in the pre-tribulation rapture before Darby. Yes. And in fact, for 300 years before Darby, and by the time Darby came along, uh, it was a pretty well established concept among even Congregationalists and others. And you what, cite Lee Brainerd, a friend of ours, who found evidence even in the ancient writings. That's right, the in the Father. ancient writings. But the, the, the point about what John Darby did was he systematized it uh, as it had not been systematized before, and he advertised it. At his, I mean, the man preached all over the world about this, and so it became an accepted viewpoint. But uh, the, the reason, of course, there are many good reasons why it was late in development. And one of those reasons is the fact that the Catholic Church uh, simply was amillennial, and that's all they taught, and uh, people accepted that. And the average person in the Middle Ages could not read or write. I mean, very few people could, mainly just priests could read and write. And they didn't have Bibles. Nobody had a Bible. You couldn't afford a Bible. And uh, so, what, what needed, what was needed for, for Bible prophecy really to revive was for people to get the Bible in their own languages. And that occurred, and, and also to be able to afford it. So, you had the invention of the Gutenberg Press, and then and along with that came the, the uh, a revolution led by Martin Luther, which uh, the Reformation, which resulted in the Bible being translated into a native language. And speaking of Martin Luther, the church, the Catholic Church, said, "Well, his uh, new idea oh. of faith uh, alone is too new to be true." So, oh yes, yes, that was their major argument against Luther. They said it's too new to be true to talk about salvation by uh, uh, grace through faith. And no, Martin Luther said, "Well." All of the church fathers believed. They said, no, there was no church father that believed in that. He said, well, have you read the writings of Peter and Paul and the sayings of Jesus? Exactly. It's all through there. <laughs> well, uh, what, it, it's not a new idea. It's an idea that was rediscovered. Uh-huh. And That's redefined. Yeah. Well, the early church fathers weren't interested in prophecy. They were interested in doctrine. And they the all time. taught eminence. They all, even though they didn't understand it completely, they taught eminence. They taught that, that the Lord could come back at any moment. Now, if you start putting all kinds of prophecies in front of that and saying, no, uh, he can't come back for a thousand years, he can't do this, he can't do that, then you're destroying eminence. We, right. the, the Bible teaches that Jesus can return any moment. The only way you can have an imminent return of Jesus is to have a rapture that is separate and apart from the second coming. Because if you put the two together, then you've got to say, no, he can't come until the temple is rebuilt, the Antichrist is rebuilt. Uh, and on and on and on. No, it has to be imminent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, I love that you have a chapter on the pan millennial view. I think it's the first book I've ever read that, that has it. And you call it an irresponsible cop out and you explain why. But for those who say, well, why study Bible prophecy? Why? How do you answer them? Why is it important? Well, I go into great detail about that in here. In fact, I give 10, ten reasons yes. for the study of Bible prophecy. I won't mention all 10, but I just mentioned that 
the quantity of, of, of the Bible, one fourth of it prophecy, that alone justifies studying Bible prophecy. The uniqueness of it. There is no other book in the world that contains fulfilled prophecies. There's not one in the in the Quran, not one in the Ved, Hindu Vedas, not one in the Book of Mormon, but the Bible contains hundreds of prophecies that are specific, not vague and general nonsense like Nostradamus, but specific prophecies that have already been fulfilled in history. And I'm not just talking about uh, Messianic prophecy. I'm talking about prophecies concerning cities and towns and nations and empires. Isaiah writing about the fact that the Babylonian Empire would be overthrown by the Medes and the Persians before the Babylonian Empire even existed. And it was overthrown by the Medes and Persians. I'm talking about Messianic prophecies like Psalm 22 that says the Messiah will be uh, killed uh, by being crucified, having his hands and his feet pierced. And there was only one way of killing people in Israel at that time, and that was by stoning them to death. And what, guess what? A thousand years later, after that was written, a thousand years before Christ, the only way to execute people in Israel was by stoning them. But the Romans were in charge, and they couldn't stone people. So they had to go to the Romans, the Romans crucified it. It on and on like that. The Bible is just full of fulfilled prophecies that convince me. And should convince anyone that it has to be supernatural in origin. It certainly does. Yeah. So. Dave, you mentioned two other end time viewpoints that are, are a little bit uh, out there, one being preterism and the other the so called pre wrath view. Yeah. Describe each of those in just a nutshell. Well, preterism is so unorthodox that I wouldn't even consider it, uh, uh, you know, couldn't even be considered mainline Christianity. But it's the uh, idea that all of the prophecies concerning the end times. All or most all, all the, the the extreme preterist says all end time prophecy was fulfilled in 70 A.D. The moderate preterist says all was fulfilled except for the second coming of Jesus. But your extreme preterists argue that it was all fulfilled, and they argue that we are in the eternal state right now, and things will just keep on going on, Why? and the, the dead will go to heaven and live there, and the rest. But. It, it, all of that is based upon the idea that the book of Revelation was written before 90, uh, 470 A.D. Uh, when the temple was destroyed. And they, uh, their main argument for that is they turn over, I think it's Revelation chapter 11, and they say, hey, it mentions a temple. And the temple was destroyed, so, uh, you know, what, what's the deal? Well, there's going to be a second temple. Right. Going to, I mean, a third temple. There's going to be a temple that's going to be the temple that's built during the first part of the tribulation and which the Antichrist comes to Jerusalem to dedicate. And so it's, it's speaking of that temple. But it, it, these guys remind me very much of Paul when he wrote, Avoid these two men. And he named two men. And he said, Avoid them because they teach that the resurrection has already occurred. Well, these guys have te teach the second coming oh, has already occurred. To analogy. do that, you have to utterly spiritualize everything. And what about the nothing means what it says? What about the pre wrath guys? Because we're not going to get into as great a detail as no, you did. It's no, fascinating to, to read your evidence well, this, against this. This is a very new view. It's uh, growing like it wildfire. Is. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it, it's the view, uh, they call it the pre wrath view, and, and that's a very, very bad title for it because the pre uh, the the pre tribulation view is a pre wrath view, uh, the mid tribulation view is a mid pre wrath view. But what they're arguing is that the, the wrath of God occurs only near the end of the tribulation. That before that, the wrath that occurs is the wrath of man and Satan and not God. And so therefore, the tri uh, the rapture is going to occur uh, three fourths of the uh, way through the tribulation. It's a, a one fourth at, near the end. Okay. Bold judgment. Uh, that's what, and so I call it the, the late tribulation viewpoint. Because if it's pre trib, it's before. If it's mid trib, it's the middle. If it's post trib, it's the end. So you've got to call it the late trib view so that it's, people know when it occurs. It right. occurs late in the tribulation. And these guys, I'm telling you, trying to figure this out was almost impossible because no one has the same idea. You ask them to draw a chart, nobody can draw a chart because everybody has a different chart and nobody knows what everybody else is teaching. It is so confused, so convoluted. Uh, but the point of it is that regardless of where you put the rapture near the end of the tribulation, you are destroying eminence because you're saying yes, you are. there has to be, you know, the first half of the tribulation, the, the, there has to be a and in three. spite of the fact that Jesus is the one that breaks the seals, they claim, well, all that's Satan's wrath. It's not yet God's well, wrath. Well, this viewpoint challenges the sovereignty of God. It challenges the sovereignty of God. It's saying that Satan and man can do things that God has no control over. 
We know from, from the Bible that God uses bad nations to, you know, penalize in other church. nations. Yes, He does. Uh, in fact, He used Babylon to penalize Judah. He used Assyria to penalize Israel. Uh, he, he, God works through evil, uh, uh, through the, uh, Satan. He can work through uh, evil of all kinds to bring about His will. And to say that these people are operating separate and apart from God's will, that's crazy. Certainly and it's a great travesty because it denies the millennial kingdom. Maybe you could tell us, and you made a great argument here, some of the reasons why the millennium is important. I mean, oh. why, why do we eject it when it yeah, contains that, so many problems. Well, that's what I end the book with is talking about why it's important to have a, you know, when I, I was raised in an amillennial church, a church so amillennial, if you had any other view, they would disfellowship you oh, formally. Word. Uh, so anyway, I, I end by talking about reasons why, uh, when, when I became, when I started studying the Bible and I could see without any problem whatsoever there's going to be a millennial reign of Jesus uh, because I believe that if the plain sense makes sense, you shouldn't look for any other sense. You end up go. with nonsense. nonsense. And so, I just believed what it said. And then I thought, well, why? I mean, why would Jesus want to come back to this filthy earth, to this sin-plagued earth? Why would He want to come back and reign? And then I began to see all kinds of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons for a millennium is uh, that God has made a lot of promises He's got to fulfill. He's made promises to the Jewish people that they will have a reign over all this earth, the believing Jewish people, that they will be so highly honored during that reign that if one walks by, a Gentile will grab his robe and say, may we walk with you because we know that God is with you. God's going to turn the world upside down concerning the Jewish people. Uh, it, God has made promises to the nations. He said to the nations, a time's going to come when there's going to be what you have always wanted, peace. We're going to have peace all over the world. Yes. Uh, it, it, he has to have a, a millennium because He has made uh, promises to the church that we're going to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ over all this earth. He makes that promise over and over and over. So those are some of the promises. He's made a promise to creation. He said to creation, I'm going to, re I'm going to revive the creation. I'm going to remake it so that everything is back the way it originally was and the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and, and on and on and on. Well, Dave, this book was a great blessing to me, and I'm already looking forward to your next project and the projects after that the Lord has in store okay. for you Thank and you us. Very much. But, folks, that's all the time we have for today. So, on behalf of David Reagan and Nathan Jones, I'm Tim Moore saying, look up, for our soon returning king is drawing near. Godspeed. Are you mystified by end-time Bible prophecy? Are you confused by all the various end-time viewpoints? Have you decided that end-time prophecy is a subject appropriate only for seminary graduates? Dr. David Reagan's book, What's the Difference in a Millennium and a Millipede, addresses the major fundamental viewpoints such as historic premillennialism, amillennialism, postmillennialism, modern premillennialism, and a fifth one, the one that Dave describes as panmillennialism, an irresponsible cop-out view that people from the pew to the pulpit use as an excuse to not study Bible prophecy. To order your copy, for a donation of $20 or more, and that includes shipping, call the number below or just ask for What's the Difference in a Millennium and a Millipede? Understanding End Time Viewpoints, or order online at lamblion.com.